Good morning. As you know, we're going to be talking about technology and independence. But to get to there, I need to share my story because technology has had a large impact on me. February 12, 2012, I was given a gift. It's a gift we are all born with. And even though I didn't know it at the time, it has been at my fingertips all along. I was incredibly active growing up and I enjoyed playing all sports like baseball, football, golf, and anything that could be done outdoors like skydiving and scuba diving. Naturally athletic, I excelled at anything I was willing to work hard at. I remember like it was yesterday, spending countless hours hitting a baseball off a tee to improve my swing. While I received good enough grades to get into college, schooling was never very important to me. It was all sports, sports, sports. Even what I did for a living was physical. I worked at a Costco warehouse and worked construction part-time. As I was no longer participating in team sports, my physical appearance became the most important thing to me. I could have even resembled somebody from the old MTV show, The Jersey Shore. Their motto was uh, GTL, Jim Tanning Laundry. That was me. The accident that left me paralyzed from the neck down even revolved around being active and playing sports. A friend of mine and myself were out playing golf one day and we decided the loser of the round would have to jump in the lake, even though it was in the middle of the winter and freezing cold. So I figured, well, there's no way I could possibly lose this bet. I was good at golf. Man, I was confident. As you probably figured out by now, I didn't win this bet and decided to jump in the lake. I was really looking forward to this. I thought it would be funny and a good story to tell afterwards. As I put on my swim trunks that day, I thought I had it all. Good friends, good health, good job, and a hell of a lot of fun living my 20s with no regrets. In the half second it took my spine to crush as I hit the bottom of the lake on those rocks, my life and my loved one's lives were about to change. The fact that I'm in sitting in front of you today could even be a miracle. When I dove into the lake, I knocked myself unconscious and was laying face down, floating around, just lifeless, drowning. Luckily, a lady happened to be walking her dog at the exact moment. I often wonder what she must have thought when she saw something in the lake. What was that? Driftwood? The Loch Ness Monster? Nope, just me. She could have even thought it was a dead body. But she rushed into the lake and pulled me out, soaking wet head to toe, and luckily was able to hang on with me until she was able to wave down a police officer who would drive me until the paramedics showed up. All of this I do not remember. The next thing I do remember is my family hovering above my hospital bed, looking more terrified than I was. The son they loved more than anything in this world had just suffered a traumatic accident. The next major event could be possibly the saddest thing that happened all along. After uh, we got a more you know, picture of my injury, the doctor residing over my care wanted to ask my mom if he could ask me if I wanted to continue to live. This was only just a couple days after I'd suffered a traumatic accident. I couldn't believe he'd ask her that. I mean, what must have she been thinking? You know, I'd like to think that if the doctor did ask me if I wanted to continue to live, I would tell him to kick rocks. You know, he was really worried that I wouldn't have brain function from drowning and what I wanted to live a life as someone who was paralyzed from the neck down. So, man, I'm glad I have a great mom. Thank you, mom, and thanks for holding my cue cards. <laughs> Why I chose to include this is, you know, how many people don't have, you know, their mother right there with them at that moment to tell the doctor that there's no way he could ask me those questions. It just saddens me to think about all the people who get left behind. Well, as it turns out, my brain still functions. Well, at least I think it does. <laughs> so over the following six months, I uh, was staying at Harborview Medical Center, and it was rather pleasant. You know, the staff was nice, and uh, 
You know, I was just trying to figure things out. And so things were going pretty good. When I regained my mental capacities, we began to get a more complete picture of my injury. You know, I was going to be, you know, paralyzed. It was going to be incredibly unlikely I was ever going to walk again. But it was also going to be really unlikely I'd ever breathe on my own. I had a, trach a tracheotomy, which is a tube that goes in your neck to help uh, push air in through a ventilator, as well as I needed to suction out my lungs to clear out all the water I had swallowed when I drowned. I struggled with pneumonia and really high fevers. And I don't know if any of you have all ever had really high fevers before, but it can give you some crazy dreams and hallucinations. At one point, I could have sworn I was on the Star Trek bridge talking to Spock. I don't think that happened. So after a few weeks in the ICU, I moved to the rehab wing at Harborview Medical Center. And, uh, you know, kind of my process to uh, walk again began. You know, I was really looking forward to this. I thought, you know, okay, this is when, you know, I can really train and get strong and, you know, I'd walk again. Everything would be great. But it wasn't looking that way. And like I mentioned, they said I'd never breathe again. And that was really, really troubling to me. I had a friend eight years earlier uh, have a very similar spinal cord injury. And um, knowing that someone else out there had, you know, was living life as a quadriplegic, there was something I could handle. But the idea of having tubes in my neck, and I just, it was really troubling to me. I thought I'd look like a monster. You know, tubing, suction machines, all of that. It was really scary to me. I would say the next thing that happened was probably the most profound moment of my life. Like I mentioned, I had a suction tube that went down my throat. And every day, the respiratory therapist would come in. And she would uh, do this uh, suction routine to you know, clear out my lungs. The tube would go down my neck. The water would come out. Just really standard, day after day. Well, one day she came in, said hello, said, hey, Tyler, we're going to do your suction routine. And I said, all right, that sounds great. Let's do it. Well, what happened was when the tubing went down my neck, it hit a nerve in my neck and my heart stopped. The last things that were going through my mind as my brain was shutting down were how much I love my family members. Um, I remember seeing a black screen with the loved one's names scrolling down the screen like movie credits. It was just really remarkable. My brain was shutting down and that was going to be it. I remember saying to myself, I do not want to die. I do not want to die. I do not want to die. And just like that, the light switch in my brain turned off like they do in a room. And just like that, I was back. The light switch had came back on. Still in shock, I was saying to myself, I do not want to die. I do not want to die. I do not want to die. That day I realized even though my life was going to be different, I really, really wanted to live. Our desires as humans is just incredible. How we'll fight through anything and how much we all want to live. The rest of my hospital stay was fairly ordinary. I decided I was going to dedicate myself to live my life as best as I could, regardless of my prognosis and my injury. After six months in the Harborview Medical Center, I was finally ready to go home. My dad had remodeled his living room and put a ramp in so I could get in and out. And we remodeled the bathroom and everything was going good. Out of the hospital, you know, I thought my mental outlook was going to be pretty good. You know, I was ready to go home. Things were looking up. The best way I can describe it is, is I was going back to a familiar environment under unfamiliar circumstances. When I was in the hospital, I felt like I belonged there. That's where, you know, sick people were. That's where injured people were. But when I got back home, it was back around things the way they used to be. I started to deal with social anxiety and depression. I 
you know, even going to a doctor's appointment was difficult. Um, my friends would try to drag me out to go to a baseball game or go out to lunch. And you would think that would be something that would, you know, uplift your spirits and, you know, make you happy. But for me, it was just incredibly difficult. I was scared to be around people. It was uh, terrifying to me because I was so different than what, how I was before. I got into a cycle of just eating television or <laughs> eating and watching television. <laughs> I don't think I've ever tried to eat a television before, but, <laughs> um, and that was it. It was a cycle of eat, TV, sleep, repeat, over and over again for two years. As this continued, there were many nights crying with my mom, her telling me everything was going to be okay, really having no idea if it was. You know, long talks with my dad as he tried to, you know, lift my spirits and tell me things were going to work out, but we really didn't know. Well, when this all started to change and the narrative of my story changed was when I figured out that technology could help me be independent. A, the deacon from my church, Jose Blakely, came over and uh, we would catch up, watch sports, and just, you know, talk about stuff. And he could kind of tell that I wanted more in my life than just watching television. And so he asked me, he goes, Tyler, why, why do you want to do so much with your life but all you do is watch TV? Why don't you ever go on a computer? And I said, well, it's too hard. The computer takes up too much space in my room. Um, it's too hard to control. It's just difficult. I don't want to do it. And he goes, well, I work at Microsoft and why don't we get you a Surface tablet and we can go ahead and mount it to the wall in your room so it doesn't take up much space. I still remember uh, when I got that computer. It was like the clouds in my brain were separating and the sun was shining through. I couldn't get off that computer for months. I regained my love for baseball. I was reading baseball blogs. I would go back online and uh, go on Facebook, social media. And it just really uh, re-energized me. It you know, gave me something to do, something I enjoyed doing, something other than just watching TV. And uh, not long after that, my brother researched and found out that using an Xbox One and a Kinect, I could also change the channels on my television by voice. Now, when you think about um, what's really important in independence, TV might not be the first thing you think of. But for me, it was because every time I wanted to change a TV channel or adjust the volume, I would have to call my dad and say, hey, Pop, can you change the channel or change the volume? And I felt like a burden. So I would often watch the same channel after my show was over. After a baseball game, whatever was on next is what I would watch. At 28 years old, I didn't anticipate being an ice skating expert, but sometimes if that's what's left on TV, that's what you watch. So. Now controlling my TV and computer, I started to think, well, wow, there's a lot more I can do with technology. There's so many more things out there, you know, controlling my lights, opening and closing my door by voice, many, many, many different things because technology can do so much. I sometimes also think, you know, as I had mentioned, I was on the ventilator that, and as you can tell, I got off the ventilator. Um, would I have went through the process of weaning off the ventilator, you know, spending countless hours with a little blow tube to help, you know, increase my lung capacity, if I hadn't have really found a new purpose and be, you know, re-energized with uh, the TV and stuff? Because at one point I was not in a good space. I was depressed. And, you know, would have I put that effort in to try to get off the ventilator? I don't know. But I do know that, you know, being able to control things and have independence in my life really put me in a better spot to try to achieve such a task. While all this was going on, my mom was relentlessly looking for a house and a mother-in-law so I could live, you know, independently, but close enough to her. And with no arms and no legs, living independently can be really, really difficult. And technology was something that could help me with that. 
and you know it was a problem I was ready to solve to figure out all of these things that would be necessary to be independent. Like I mentioned, opening and closing a door by voice, controlling a TV by voice, uh, lights by voice, thermostat by voice, all of these things could be done. I could even operate a cell phone with the use of my wheelchair drive controls. So I researched and found ways to do all of these things. And uh, it's a great feeling to know that five years ago, I honestly thought my life was going to consist of watching TV. But, you know, these are great things. And I can live, I'm really, really proud to say I live completely independently now. You know, I don't know if I would have been able to figure all of this stuff out if my friend Jose hadn't had introduced me to these technologies. So it was a real big deal for me. And uh, but what I do know is the gift of the human mind is something to be cherished. You know, I lost a lot when I was injured, but I didn't lose the use of my mind. And I still have that, and I was able to use it, and I was able to, you know, do everything I want to do. I never thought I would live independently. Never in a million years. And with all these technologies and a wonderful family, I'm so happy that I can do all these things. And now, rather than put all of my effort into my body and my physical appearance, I can put it into my mind. Thank you.